Hello UT and hello the world, I'm your host, Andrew Rosas. One of the most important factors in battle is the element of surprise. Sadly, Surprisium is highly unstable, so military forces have used secret coded messages to maintain the advantage over their enemies for centuries. This includes coded messages sent during the Civil War on both the North and South sides. I've always wondered what these coded messages said, and if they're anything like the messages I send on the South side of Austin. Dearest Martha, I hope this letter finds you well. I pray the bitter 70 degree winters have not set upon you yet. As I write this from 35 South Band, I'm given every indication that we may move today, maybe tomorrow. I hope these texts will fall under your eye long after I am no more. I stay strong in my conviction and determination to bring home tacos, which seem to bind me together with mighty ropes that only queso can untie. Now loosed upon my journey, the desire to return with this sustenance bears me like a mighty crashing wave back to our tiny apartment. Love enduring, Andrew. Luckily, thanks to a collaboration between the Briscoe Center and the Math Department, some of these secret telegrams from the Confederacy have actually been decoded. And we got to talk with Assistant Director for Communications for the Briscoe Center, Benjamin Wright, to tell us more. So, how did this decoding project even happen? So at the moment, the Briscoe Center is working on a exhibit about its southern collections. And so through combing through collections, we came across these telegrams that have been at UT since the 1930s. Uh, but they were different from others, obviously, because they were encrypted and they were sort of in, in gibberish. And uh, we had no idea what they said and, uh, and we had no idea how to decode them. So we thought, well, maybe someone at the math department will know. Seeing these pages of gibberish must have been confusing. I mean, <laughs> is the South drunk telegramming again? So how did these documents find their way to the Briscoe Center? In the early 20th century, a gentleman called George Littlefield uh, created a pot of money at UT to invest in Southern history um, collections. Um, one of the first purchases, uh, one of the early purchases, was of uh, these telegrams uh, as part of an array of documents that were found in a Mississippi farmhouse in the 1930s. What can these telegrams tell us about the Civil War? We do um, get a, um, a, an insight into a confederacy that um, is struggling to hold things together, a, a campaign that's in disarray. And um, we um, are able to connect through the people named in the telegraph, such as Kirby Smith, Jefferson Davis, uh, Edward Canby. Um, we get this picture of the what's called the Trans-Mississippi um, Department of the Confederacy, and also of just the, the Western Front in the Civil War, the Western theater of the Civil War. And I guess the million dollar question is, what did the telegram say? sort of like a the dog ate my homework kind of note where where general kirby smith is saying i cannot send troops to the east uh, we can't cross the mississippi even if we could there are union forces um, making demonstrations um, um, i think one of the phrases is um, a, a sort of um a menacing attitude that they're, they're, they're deploying a menacing attitude towards our troops so so you've got a sort of laundry list of reasons why general kirby smith cannot send troops uh to um the eastern theater of the civil war where which is where uh, uh, most of the action was and which is where general uh, robert e lee eventually surrendered we also got to talk with andrew blumberg associate professor of mathematics at ut who actually worked on decoding these messages so how were these telegrams encrypted they used a, a sort of a modern variant of, of a substitution cipher. So a substitution cipher is the following thing, and this I think was known, you know, this is often called a Caesar cipher, and is known to the Romans and probably earlier. And the way this works is that you, you assign each letter of the alphabet a number, and then you pick another number, which is the shift, and then you take your, the numbers in your message and you add the shift to them. So if your shift is three, you know, an A was one, A goes to four, so the first letter becomes D. And if the second letter is, I don't know, F, you add four to F and you get, you know, F, G, H, I. So you get I, and the whole message is shifted like that. There's a refinement of this, um, which is called uh, a Visionaire cipher. And the way that works is you pick a key phrase. 
and the key phrase, you know, could be the first sentence of, uh, you know, of, of a book you like, or it could be part of song lyrics, or just some meaningful phrase to you that you can remember. And you and you know, and you and everyone you're going to exchange messages with have to remember this phrase. And then what the phrase does is it means for each position of the message that you're actually sending, there's a different shift. So if the phrase is uh, Andrew, then the first letter is shifted by one for A, the second letter is shifted by whatever, you know, I don't know, 12 or 13 or whatever letter N is, the third uh, letter is shifted by four for D, and so on. And when you get to the end of the phrase, you start at the beginning again. And so I wrote some code to do that, to attack these, to, to try to break these messages. But before I did that, I looked at the, uh, the, the very small literature of people who worry about this. And it turns out that there are something like 17 key phrases that the Confederacy was known to use, and three were sort of the most popular. And the messages in question were encoded with the key phrase, complete victory. And so after you know, a little bit of guessing. And actually the hardest part of dealing with it was the fact that uh, lots of the characters were illegible, and of course that screws everything up if you could transcribe it wrong, and so I had to noodle around to guess with those until I could make it resolve into English. But it was uh, a less mathematical endeavor than, uh, than uh, I had originally imagined. My thanks to Andrew and Benjamin for giving us a better insight into the past, and for fostering a new collaboration here at UT. Maybe in the future, similar collaborations will help historians figure out what our encoded messages say. What the hell does kitty cat eggplant prayer hands mean? Hey, if you like this video, please share it with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Mr. Andrew Rosas, and also follow the Texas X's as well. As always, I'm your host, Andrew Rosas, reminding you to stay hooked.